that's not the way. Okay, hopefully everyone sees the shared um, notebook. So, uh, this week we're going to start with going through the functions, how to define a function and how to use functions. Uh, Python doesn't um, differentiate between a function and subroutines. It's all called functions. To write a function, you start with def space. You give a name to your function. Within the parentheses, you have all your arguments. And then there's a column. And then the body of your function is indented once. Um, so that's, there's no and at the end, just like the loops and the if. It's just the indentation that makes the function. There's a special three apostrophes here string. It's called the doc string. Um, it's usually how you put the documentation on your string and to show the on the documentation on your function to specify what it does, put some information on your arguments, for example. Okay. So this function takes two arguments, arg1 and arg2, and it adds add them together, and then it returns the total. Um, so you see the return um, keyword is for to return a value from the function. You can return uh, several values separated by a comma, so it's not just one value. Okay, so let's define a function. And to call a function, it's relatively simple. Just put the name, parentheses, your arguments, and if it returns a value, you can store the value in a variable. Okay, it did one plus two equals three. Perfect. Okay, so the type of arguments, uh, you can specify arguments in different ways. Uh, you can specify them by position, like here. So uh, you see, I just put two values. So the first value will go in the first argument, the second value will go in the second argument. Or we can uh, refer to the arguments by name. Um, any, anyone can be referred to by name. So I can call my function like this. When I refer to the arguments by name, it doesn't matter the order of the names uh, because then Python knows which one to, to get to. And there are a few things that are illegal. Um, you can mix positional and named arguments, uh, but uh, you can't have, if you mix, you need to have the positional arguments first and the keyword arguments after, so this is illegal. And when you mix uh, positional and keyword arguments, the positional will still follow the same rule. So this will go to the first argument, arg1. And here you see my keyword argument is also for arg1. So it doesn't like it because it has two values for arg1. Um, so this is not valid. Uh, you can't say this will work because arg1 will be equal to one and then Two, we go to act two, it doesn't work this way. Okay, so how to do optional arguments? Um, you simply define a value, default value here, uh, during the definition of the function. And then after you, since it's optional, you need to have an if um, statement. So in this case, you can see that um, if I call my function with only one argument, that's arg1, and it will just return arg1. And if I have two arguments, um, it multiplies both together. So now, here I've rewritten the function a bit differently. And in this case, when I call it with one and zero, I would expect one times zero equals zero, but it tells me um, I've got a result of one. Can anyone see what's going on there? Nope, okay. So the problem here is here. So, 
This is true of most of the points. This is false when opt is considered false by Python. And I think it's in the first week we've seen that Python considers false everything that is non false or zero. So because our call here opt equals zero, it's considered a false. So my function does that. So you have to be careful when you do optional arguments to do the right if condition and to remember what person consider false and what person consider true. And just one thing about those um, notebooks here, when you see answer, you can click on it and it gives you the answer. Um, so when you, if you use the notebooks letter or whatever, you can always uh, get back the answer. Okay, so um, obviously op optional arguments like this don't necessarily have to be equal to nouns, they can be equal to a default values, or whatever you want. Um, here I've just used simple numbers, you can use whatever object you want. Um, and here you see it's a default value, so if I call it with only one argument, I get one plus five because opt equal five, six, and if I call it with something else, I get one plus six equals seven. So that's okay. And okay, so if you remember, I told you about the asterisks and double asterisks. So with any function, you can use the asterisks and double asterisks to pass the arguments. So if you have your arguments in a tuple or list, you can simply just do asterisk your tuple or list. If it's in a dictionary, you can just do double asterisk. And both these work, you know. Uh, it both do one plus four equal five. And so this works with any function. So, you know, it doesn't have to have any dif different definition of the arguments or anything. It just works. Um, so I had a question last week about uh, using dictionaries to give options to a plot. So I've just added a, um, a small section. This is a basic way of doing a line plot. Uh, you give the X from zero and one and you give the Y zero one and then it creates a line. I'm going from zero zero to one one. Let's do that. But obvious, but in Python, you can give a lot of options to your plots. Uh, so you can choose the width of the lines, the color, you can add markers for your data points and so on. And so if you want, you can define a dictionary like this with all your options. And then your plot line becomes just this, where you have a static plot, whatever instead of having all the options there on the same line uh, and having a very long line. And this gives you just that, um, a pink line with markers at the end. Okay, so this is a very simple example. I just wanted to give you a bit more examples. So this is the Matplotlib documentation and it shows you all the feeling style possibility for a marker. And to do that, they plotted six different lines, which are all the same, except for the fill uh, option in the mark of the markers. And what's good is that they give you the code that they use to do that. And so you see that they start here by defining a, a dictionary, which has all the options that are the same for all the lines. So the line style is all the dots. Marker are all circles. Marker size is all the same. It gives you the colors to use and so on. And then after to do the, all the lines, they do a, a loop. And what they do is that all the options that are the same come from the dictionary and they simply specify the options as different in between all of those, which is a field style for the marker there. So that gives you a, a bit more of a real example of 
how you can use it for mixing between things that are always the same and things that change from one part to the other. And last one about the ast double asterisk is that sometimes you look at documentation of option of functions and you'll see that and you see this double asterisk marking there which just means it it allows for a lot uh, of more of keyword arguments and here you have a long list of possible arguments and i want to show these ones for example okay subplot kws and cbar kw args they're both dictionary and typically they will be used the same as with the double asterisk in a function to de define the color bar here and here to define subplots if you have subplots. So you see that it's some, if, you are, if you give a dictionary there, it will be unpacked with the double asterisk, the same in, in whatever function uses it to define all the arguments of the function. Okay, is that clear the use of the double asterisk for plotting, for example, but other functions as well? Good. So, something to keep in mind is what is in scope of your function? What does your function know? Uh, or so, this is a code. So, I've defined a variable total that's equal to zero. Then I define a function summing that takes two arguments that sums them to be a zero and returns a total. I run it. And then I print, sorry, I run it and then I print the, the value of total after the function. And then there's a second function that also takes two arguments that addition them with total and return tt. And then I give you the, the value of the final add, which is number three plus four. So you see in the first case here, total equals zero before the function and equals zero after the function. And you see here that although I call sum two, three plus four, I get add equal nine. So the question is what's happening there? In the first case, you see total is defining the function and because, it, because of the way it's defined, you see like that with the addition there and uh, assignment, it becomes a local variable of the function. So this total has nothing to do with this one. Okay, this is only a local variable that will disappear once you return from the function. And that's why at the end of the function total, as not changed values there. In the second function, I use total, but I haven't defined it in the function, and it still works. It's simply because it sees that it's not in the function, so it goes in the scope above the function to see if it exists, and it finds a total here that exists that's equal to two. So it will do R1 plus R2 plus two. And that's why at the end you are adding an equal nine. And I put it here not to show you what to do, but to show you not what to, <laughs> to show you what not to do. Be very careful. Python will go out of the function to find a variable if possible. So never use in your functions variables that haven't been defined in the function or passed by argument. It's fine to do that. Because then, then you, you realize that you take it from outside and whatever. But otherwise, you can end up with very strange results very quickly. So just be careful. Um, this will work, but not necessarily the way you want it. Is that clear? I hope it's clear because we're going to use that and see 
even more um, not complicated, but yeah, complicated, I guess. Okay. And where it gets complicated is whether the arguments are passed by reference or value. In Python, the arguments are passed by reference. That means they still point to the same location in memory outside and within a function. And that means you can change your values within a function where, without realizing you're changing them if you're not careful. So I have two functions here. One takes an input argument and changes its first um, element to be three. And the second one takes an uh, input argument and then says this argument equal uh, the list five, four. Now I define a list that's one, two. And then I call both functions and I see what my list is. And so the list of my other stats is one, two. The list after change me is three, two, because this ally here is the one given by the argument, so it's the same as this one. Okay, so because I change. And the different, so in this case here, I redefine completely total. So it was a local variable. In this case here, it's only the first element of my argument that is changed. So it changes the whole it changes uh, the value of my variable outside the function as well. Good job. And after my second function, I still have my list the same. So what happened here is what happened is like here, I just redefine completely my list. So li becomes a variable that points, it becomes a local variable that points to something completely different. And so he, this function doesn't do anything actually. You know, it's li, this, this variable disappear when after the return and the argument there wasn't changed and nothing is returned. So it just doesn't do anything. Is it clear the difference between the two? I think Rita has a question in the chat. Sure. Um, why? We can't name local functions the same as global ones as we did for total. And I'm sorry, I'm not quite, I, I must have, I'm, I'm, I was a little bit distracted. I don't quite know what she means with that. Um, what do you mean by local functions and global ones? Do you mean local functions or local variables? Yes, we can name local variables the same as uh, global ones. That's fine. Um, so the problem here was that total here was not defined in the function. So in this case, it, it, because it doesn't have any local variables to look for, it will look for a variable uh, outside, the, outside the function and go up each cop to f try to find one. Okay, in this case, we define a local variable, so then it's fine. We are global variable and local variable are separate variables that have the same name, but it doesn't matter. Is that what you were asking? Okay. So, yeah, so here is really be careful to really define all the variables you use in your um, functions, otherwise, it might use something else that you didn't realize existed. Okay, um, no, you shouldn't force Python to look outside the function if possible. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can, but it can be very dangerous. The best thing is that if you want to use a, this value of, fun, of total that is defined outside the function, the best is to add it to the arguments list because then then you know very well what is used and there's no ambiguity. Okay, so 
Um, do you remember what I discussed about copies of um, value of variable that usually Python does a pointer and not a copy? So often we will see something like that. So you get a function that has an argument, and the first thing you do is uh, a local variable recall my argument so that I will keep my argument safe. And then I can do whatever I want with my local variable and everything will be hunky dory. And in Python, it doesn't work this way um, because uh, lock is only a pointer to the same place in memory as an MRI. And so if you change one, you change the other. Can anyone remember how to do it so that it doesn't happen, so that it makes a actually makes a copy and doesn't change? the li argument. Anyone? No? Oh, okay, so if you actually want to make a copy, I will actually. Um, if you actually want to make a copy. You need to do something like list li. And in this case, you can see that the result of my function is three, two, but my input argument hasn't changed, it's still one, two. Okay, so remember, um, for a list, for example, that's the way to make a copy for topos. Uh, third part doesn't matter, but for dictionary it's dict and stuff like that. Okay, that's about it for functions. Do you have any questions so far? Or? No? Okay. So, Let's go and work with files. Um, we're not going to look at NetCDF files today, but just text files. How do you get input from a text file and write to a text file? There's an open function in Python to uh, open a file. It takes two arguments, the name of the file and the opening mode for the file. And the mode is R for read, W for write, A for append, and R plus for read and write. So this function can open text files and can also open binary files. You need to tell to Python that it's a binary file by adding a B to the mod. So you would have RB, WB, AB, RB plus. Okay, so when you're oh, when you call this function, it creates what is called a file object. And this file object after are three methods for reading, which are read, read line, and read lines. So read will read the entire file. Read line will read just one line each time you call it. And read lines will also read the entire file. And what's good is that Python manages the conversion of the end of line markers. So if you have a file coming from Windows in Linux, it will have strange end of line markers, but Python should be able to read that without you to have to worry about converting the file first. So that's kind of neat. And the inverse is the same. And, and then when you're finished reading your file, you have a close method to close your file. So why do we have three read methods? And uh, let's just go through it. Here I also use the seek method that uh, allows you to go to a specific place in the file. Here I use it with zero. That means each time I read the file, I just go back to the start so that, uh, to see better what we do. So I open my file in reading mode and then I read all of this, and then if I print everything, um, this is the output of the read um, method, 
looks like this. First line looks just like this because I call it one, so it's just the first line of the of the file. And whole two, you see, it looks like this. So it's a whole two. It's pretty easy. It's a list of strings, and each string is a is one line of the file. Okay, each element of the list is one line of the file. So the question is, what is whole file then? If you print it directly like this, you see that it's actually one long string. It read the whole file in one string, and it kept the, uh, and you can see here too, when Python reads from a file, it keeps the end of line um, markers. So that's why the print could print it with different lines, because it just, the process as going to the line train prettily like that. Okay, so sorry. So that um, shows you the three different ways of reading a file, which can be useful in different um, in different cases. Obviously, you also have. Um, options to write to file. So is, someone is not muted, if you don't mind. Thank you. You also have an option to write to file. Um, so you can open a file with W and you can write a string with write. You can also have several lines at the same time in a list and call write lines, and lines is a list and write anything. So if I do that, and then I use the uh, add Python magic commands to use a, the bash cat command to see what's in the file, I get this. As you can see, it's probably not quite what I wanted. <laughs> so, you can see that here I'll call write twice, but it printed everything on the same line. So by default, Python just writes the string you give and then stays up at the end and then put whatever else you want to write and so on. So you have to tell Python when to go to the line if you want several lines. And that's what this is for. So if we do it again correctly, you see, you put the backslash n every time. And then this time, I get something that looks a lot more what I want. Okay, so um, you have to be careful that here it says write lines, uh, but it won't actually write several lines until you, unless you tell it that there are several lines. And the last thing to see with the files because it's used a lot and is our Python as a with statement. And it's commonly used with files uh, because it provides better error handling and closes the file for you so you don't forget to close your file. So that's how it works. You say with, you put your open statement, you put a as f to define the name of your uh, file variable, file object, column, and then again, just um, the indentation to define what's in within the width, and then you can do whatever you want on your file there. And what happens is that when I get out of the width, the file is automatically closed. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. So when I get out of the way, the file is automatically closed. So if I got this, print first line, I get it, but then I get an error. Our operation on close file, you see this one is out of the way. So it, it's, the file has been closed and doesn't work. Okay, this um a small exercise here. Um, we're not 
probably going to do it like that um, because it would have been better if you had prepared a bit in advance, which we haven't asked you to. So typically is to take, so these are sizes take this uh, file, the test.txt, and just trying to get only the um, values, the numerical values, um, kind of how to read the CSV file using only the Python uh, default open file and list. Um, okay, and here I was telling you, you can check all the Python built-in functions. And just to show you, the documentation has a whole list of all the built-in functions. Um, can be useful for you to go and have a look one day to understand what's uh, available for you. To you, by default, uh, some are more of are more useful than others. Um, I would go and try and understand what enumerate does. Um, sorted can be interesting too. Uh, obviously, that to sort uh, variables, values in variables. Um, there's probably others. Uh, we saw the all and any. Uh, there are all the functions to change type, like the tuple or str for to define a string and so on. But anyway, just to let you know to have a look when you are ready for it. Okay, so we're just going to look at the answer to show you that it's not that simple to read the CSV file using only the default Python stuff. And typically, it's not something you would do. You would use something else to use a C to read a C CSV file, but this can just be um, a simple way to read a bit of Python and understand what's happening. So you see that we start with the with statement, and everything is indented at least once. So if everything is sorry, <coughs> or everything is within this with statement. So we open our file for reading. The beginning is simply to skip the header because we have two lines of header before the numbers. So we just define the lines and we call f read line twice, twice so that we get rid of the first two lines. And so this way, Python is at the start of the numbers to read, ready to read the start of the numbers. Um, here I define three lists to give you the way of getting three different formats, um, just for fun. Okay, so the default reading gives you strings, so you have to read the string and then pass it to become whatever to become numbers and list as you can, as as you want. So what you do, you can do is for line in f dot read lines. So that means it will call f.read lines and get the list of lines in your file. And then line will iterate through this list to get each line one at a time. And first what we do is we split along the comma so that we get only the numbers in. Um, this will give us a list of numbers as in strings, and then we, this is to convert each number in the list in uh, integer, and that's a format we haven't seen to define a list that is very well used. So, if I do that here, Um, we'll do it once, so that will be easier to. Okay, so int is a built-in function which converts something into an integer, if possible. And so what I could do is I could do for 
the number in TT, which is a list, do a TMP. What I could do is define a, an empty list and then add to it equal int of number. Okay, so this we've seen, you define a, an empty list and you, you loop through your TT list for, to get each number and then you convert this number to an integer and you append it to your list as you go. So it will create your list of. If I do. Um, what did it tell me? It's, oh, yes, it didn't do that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Sorry, it's not what it should be. Why it doesn't work for the name? Oh, that because ah. yes, of course. Um, sorry. So you see here it will um, it will create my my list of numbers as I want it, but this is a bit long to type. So often this can be um, summarized with something like that. For num in TT. So you see you have the same four lines here and there and instead of an append you just say I want each of my elements to be int of num and put all this in a list. Is that clear the this notification? This notation? And what's interesting with this notation, you can also combine with all the four or some if, so pardon, if num inferior to 50, for example. Oh, and you see, um, good thing. Here suddenly TMP became red in the notebook. It's because the indentation is not right. It doesn't correspond to anything. So it's telling you there's a syntax error. So if I do it this way, ah, sorry. This way, you know, it only takes what's the number in figures to fifty. So it's it's just a shorter way to write a for and if loop and whatever. Okay, so we got our list of numbers. Um, each line is a list of numbers and we see that in one case we just want one list with both lists kind of concatenated together and the other case we just want one list with each of the lists being one element of the um, end list and then after it's complicated. So the first one where we want all the numbers in each being an element in one list 
that's where you use the extend method. The other one where you want to keep each line as one separate list, you use the append method. And the third one is really a pain to write in default pattern. Um, you can dig into it if you want, how it works, but yeah, it just, just a pen. You typically have to define your main list and the first time you have to, to add the first number here and as a list of one element. And then for the lines after you simply add to this, this internal list by append. Um, anyway. Okay, so as you see, the open uh, function that exists in Python is good but limited in its functionalities. It's really just read some strings and that's it. Any question here? Do you want me to go further into details of the code or you're fine? So that's it for um, the uh, default pattern. And the good thing with pattern is that uh, there's a lot of development of additional functionalities, which are put in what is called packages. And there are two things to know. First, when you start pattern, very little gets loaded by default. So when you install Python, you install a lot of functionality, but not all of it will be loaded by default when you start Python. So, and this is to save, to um, have a quicker start of the interpreter and a lower memory usage. And uh, so sometimes you will need more than the default. And there are also additional packages that are developed independently of a Python to add to it. These have to be installed. Uh, separately and can be after added to to Python. Uh, we at the CMS um, maintain several Python environments to avoid duplication. So most of the cases you won't need to install packages yourself. Uh, if you're trying to use something really special or that doesn't um, exist in Conda or yeah, whatever, you might need to install it in your own environment yourself, but um, the best thing is to first ask us. So you are all welcome to use uh, the environments we maintain. You need to become, for this you need to be a member of the project HH5. So for this you go to my.nti.org.au search for the project HH5 and ask to join. We treat it as an open project, so anyone who asks is granted access. It's only with access, so we don't mind. Um, module load, Conta will load the stable environment for Python 3. And we have a frozen environment for Python 2, which we do not recommend you using because Python 2 has been uh, stopped being developed. Uh, and when I say the stable environment for Python 3, we um, update the environment every quarter. So every quarter, uh, we update the packages in the environment. And during the quarter, we have an unstable environment where we install all new packages people have asked us to install or we update the package if we need to for whatever reason. Um, so some people might have to use the unstable environment but by default start with start with that by default and see after if it doesn't work for you. And you can see what packages are in the environment with Conda list once you have loaded the environment. Okay, so how do you use these packages or how do you uh, 
load more than the default, you use import. It's usually done at the top, but it doesn't have to. Um, you know, especially in a notebook, if you suddenly realize you need something else, you can just import the something else wherever you are. So this is the basic form, import and the name of the package. Uh, you can give an alias to your package for your program so that you have less typing to do, for example. You can import only a part of a package. Uh, it can be done this way or both ways. So you can say format prohib import this part only, as, or you can say import this part. So you see that the dot notation again from Python objects, and you give it a little name if you want. And once you have loaded your packages, you can simply use, if you want to use a method from a package, you, you have to use the name of the package dot that method. And here it's NP because I gave it the alias NP. And NumPy is a package for uh, arrays in Python. So here you see I've created an array of 20 elements. Um, here I've listed some useful packages. It's not an extensive list, it's just a start. The first ones are from basic Python install. Uh, they are mostly to do with files and directories um, functions. Altpath is good if you want to write something to which you can give options via command line instead of changing your code. And subprocess is useful if you need to write, you have a Python code and you need to call, I don't know, a, a bash function or whatever, you can do this with subprocess. And these are additional packages. I uh, will not go in the order they were listed here. Um, we recommend you use X Array for arrays. It's integrated with, it integrates NetIDL very well. Um, it's very, very good. X Array is built upon NumPy, which is the default for arrays in Python. And it's also built. It's not built upon Pandas, but it's an extension of Pandas, so it works quite well with Pandas. And Pandas is really the ultimate to work with time series. So anything to do with complicated time functionality, you look at Pandas. Um, and when I say it's the ultimate to work with time series, everyone using it, bankers, like financial analysts, whatever, use it. Um, it's not just a little world of, uh, environment sciences. Uh, SciPy is for kind of scientific, it's called scientific Python, so you know I have to FFT, ODE, whatever, all these uh, fun mathematics functions, statistics kind of thing is there. And then after both of these are for plotting in Python. Uh, Matplotlib is just for plotting and CatoPy handles map projections. One um, word of advice about map projections, if you look on the internet and everywhere, you might sometimes find some solutions that use a, a package named BezMap. BezMap is not um, maintained anymore or developed anymore and they recommend to use CatoPy instead. So if you find something using BezMap, try to find the equivalent, how to do the same thing with CatoPy, um, because you don't want to use BezMap. Uh, it's not anymore in our um, corner environment. And then you can do some parallelization with Dask if you have very large data sets to um, analyze. It's, it integrates with X-Array very well, so it's really good. Okay, and this. There's more questions, but I'll get it. Um, I haven't seen any 
more questions in the chat. Um, there was one um, question that the square brackets denote that the, com this com that the comprehension is a list. Um, there are similar things for dictionaries and I think tuples as well and other um, data structures for Python. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the just most, to... most common one is, is this list. Yeah. So just to say, yes, this, this is a, the default way to define a list. I mean, you can also say list uh, parentheses, but you can use the square bracket is a list. If you put parentheses like that, um, you define an empty tuple. And if you put this, that's an empty dictionary. So you could, you could do this, um, except you, have, you need a key there uh, for, for key in uh, num1, num2, num3, and then I could have a key like that. I could define a dictionary like that. So you see my key is there and I should probably I think you would need to use zip for that too, because yeah, it to would have worked this way. But anyway, yeah. Um, anyway, it wouldn't work this way. But just to give you an idea, you could you could define a dictionary um, another way. And I think creating an empty tuple is not very useful because tuples are immutable, so you can't yes. add to that. <laughs> yes, it's not very useful. Um, um, actually, I'm not even sure that creates an empty tuple. Maybe it doesn't, and that's why. I don't it's think it does, actually. actually. Um, yes. So, thank you very much for the for the session.